Why do you say the more people dislike the antagonist, the more they'll get involved in the story? Well, I don't agree with that, so go ahead. I think that's a little... I don't know if we said that in the book, did we? Um, I think that's too simple. Well, let's put it this way. Think of it as you have... You know, we talked about two basic factors. You got your conflict, you got your character. Now, within conflict, um, you have an antagonist who's going to provide a, a big source of your conflict, and then you've got your protagonist who's going to fight against it. The bigger the, 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 bigger the conflict, well, how are you going to raise the conflict? One of the easiest ways is you have a better and better antagonist. If the person is clever, ruthless, creative, it's a much more interesting antagonist right. than big teeth and a lot of saliva. Right. But, but again, if you, if you want to make the, the conflict look insurmountable, mm. and you know, um, I mean, it could be a fire-breathing monster, or it could be a professor who is not going to let you get your degree because your work was too close to his, you know, it doesn't matter. They can be equally diabolical. Yeah. And the more bad traits you give that person, the, the more bad things that person is willing to do, um, the bigger your conflict is going to be. And again, it could be very obvious, ruthless things, or it could be very, very subtle things. Mm. And sometimes the subtler things are more insidious because right. nobody sees them. Mm -hmm. But it's still... The, the worse your antagonist is, the more you can raise the stakes, the more you yeah. can make the conflict bigger. Um, I'm going to go back to Die Hard because I still think it's the best movie in that genre. Um, he was a great antagonist. And what made him great? Well, two things. One, it was brilliantly, the accent. The brilliantly, accent. The accent. brilliantly written. It's all the accent. Um, well, the thing about Alan Rickman is he was a Shakespeare trained British actor and done, you know, state. Um, I can almost tell an actor who's worked on the stage from one who's never worked on the stage. But what they wrote, uh, Stephen D'Souza, um, what he did, which was really interesting, is that he made the antagonist as interesting, if not more interesting, than the Bruce Willis character. And, and there's a twist. You think that they're terrorists. If you remember the movie, you think they're terrorists. Everybody else thinks they're terrorists, but they're really just crooks. Crooks. And the Bonnie Bedelia's line in the movie is, You're just con common thieves. And he says, and it's right at the top of the third act, he says, There is nothing common about me, madam, or something along <laughs> that. I mean, and he had the $1,000 suit, the Armani, you know, and you understood him. See, that's the that's the trap in villains is if you don't understand the villain and you don't care a little bit about how crazy and evil they are, I don't think there's a movie. And the thing that I also love about about that movie is he was playing a psychological game with Bruce Willis's character and that's the danger in writing, and I say this, this is about writing scripts, not and you know novels or plays or anything. The danger is to not make the antagonist, which is what I prefer to call them, more, more interesting than your protagonist, which a lot of people will do in the early drafts because protagonists are harder to write flaws into because that's the character typically the writer identifies with, right? But I don't think that antagonist, yes, I mean, I think calling them just a villain limits an act. Because I do a lot of talking now about, and I think it's really important for writers to understand, what's playable in a scene and what's not. So actors will always say that. You know, how am I going, you say she's angry. That's not a playable thing. How is she angry? How is she expressing that anger? Then the then, then actor can start looking into, because they want to give, the, you know, especially today with all this great stuff being written, they want to do um, 
they want to really go into and find a way into those characters. This thing is really interesting that I've told you about, um, Gaslit. The guy, he's a very famous character actor, I can't think of his name, but he's playing Gordon Liddy, probably one of the most evil people that ever walked the face of the earth. And I saw an interview with him, and he said, the script allowed me a way in, and the way in was his feelings for his family. So he wasn't, he, I mean, the guy was loved Adolf Hitler. There were all kinds of things about the real Gordon Liddy that are just, he was insane too, but he loved his family. And that's the way the actor went in. Writers have to think about that when they're writing. They can't just write like, you know, a kind of a stick figure character and say, a lot of writers I know when they're starting, they'll go, well, the actor will fill that in. You know, you, you, good luck getting an actor to play the role. And when you get to be a little bit more experienced, you start thinking about the, the other people who are going to involved in this collaborative experiment that you do when you're on a show or a film is like it's not just about you it's about everybody you know you know the interior exterior stuff and scripts i don't think a lot of people realize that the last person that matters to is the writer the writer puts that in there for the set designer for the cost you know all those things are done for other people and i i don't think that's taught it's not no it's not just a, a thing to do why would we need it? We know the script. We need to know if it's interior or exterior. We need to know how many, you know, what are the costumes? What are, so that's why you don't write too much. You don't do other people's jobs for them, but you help them to maybe see the world. That was what William Goldman always said, and I think it's great. Don't, don't design costumes and don't cast the movie. Like what I always have to tell students is don't say he's 40. First of all, what does 40 look like? And second of all, casting directors will get so angry with you. I, you know, a, a, a white man who's 40, what does that even mean? So, imagination. But I think you want to be careful about making a generalization. Never make a generalization. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> about the, the nature of an antagonist. Right. Because there are some antagonists who were just bad from the beginning. Yeah. Everything about them is bad and you hate everything they do. <clears throat> and they're really obviously evil, terrible people. Um, that has the risk of being cartoony. Right. <clears throat> but it can also just be such an evil person. You know, when you have Hitler as your antagonist, that's a pretty good antagonist. Not such a nice guy, at least so I've heard. Um, but sometimes it's the guy that you don't even realize is the antagonist till way later who's done things so subtly and so small and so insidious that everybody's wondering why these terrible things are happening and nobody can identify the source mm -hmm. and every point in between. So <clears throat> I think it's a decision you make about the kind of script you're writing and you know, if it's a war movie, Hitler is more interesting. If it's uh, um, somebody who really wants a degree um, and she's never returned a professor's favors um, and can't get the degree by, it's a whole different thing and it can be just as insidious. Yeah, that doesn't really contradict anything I'm saying. I'm I just didn't saying. Say it, it did. No, I know, I know. But it does, but, don't but punch, I didn't say just it. don't punch, because I'm a very delicate flower. No, no, I'm no. Just, I'm, all I'm, I'm saying is, no matter what you do, dimensional, dimensionalize. You know, this is one of the reasons that I'm not a fan of of superhero movies, except with a few exceptions. The Robert Downey ones are great. But, but I'm thinking the way you asked the question yeah. made it sound like, well, the more, the more horrible. And I don't think that's necessarily true. Right. And it's, right. <clears throat> it's the subtlety, the guile with which it's done, mm -hmm. um, the intensity. I mean, <clears throat> if you think of all the different dimensions you can be bad on, it's a lot of dimensions. You know, I, I had, there was a, a very, very famous psychologist named Albert Ellis who I had the, the great opportunity to spend a week doing a practicum with him. Mm. And he did an interesting thing where he said, uh, here's a desk, can you measure it? 
And everybody said, yeah, that's easy. You just take a tape measure. No, that's measuring its length. I want you to measure the desk. I say, well, what do you mean? So, well, how many ways can you measure a desk? Well, you could also do its weight. You could do its height. You could do the material it's made of. You can do the cash value of it, its age, its antique value. It's how many dimensions can you measure? And it starts to become near infinite. And then say, now let's measure a person. And when you start seeing all the possible dimensions you have to play with. And then there's an interesting phenomenon in the psychology of problem solving that <clears throat> When the dimension that you're looking for to solve a problem is the salient dimension, it's very easy to solve the problem. Mm. When it's not salient, it's very difficult. So I would do a demonstration with students where I'd say, um, I'd point to a black student and I'd point to a white student. Say, okay, the question is, what's the difference between these students? And they'd say, well, one is black, one is white. Easy because that's the first thing you notice about them. I do it with an old person and a young person. Easy. Now I give them another one where I'm looking at, are they wearing tennis shoes or leather shoes? What's the difference between these people? And they're guessing all sorts of crap and they don't get anywhere close to the problem mm -hmm. because the dimension wasn't salient. It wasn't a dimension you'd see easily. So if you think about using that in your script and you start to say, Let's not take the obvious thing. How bad is your super weapon? And rather, how, what's the subtle power you have to stop this person? Mm. All of a sudden, it becomes a totally different script, and it can be diaboliker than the other way of going about doing it. So you asked a, you asked a very profound question. She's good at that. I have one thing to add. I don't want to forget this because it's in the book and almost everybody told us this and I think this is a relatively new thing that people didn't ask 20 years ago. And Peter reminded me of it when he was just talking about degrees of evil and stuff See, like that. It's my fault. Actually, it's a good thing. You're going to be you if you're not asked, they're not doing their job. The question I have when somebody pitches is why you why now? So uh, uh, I think I think it's like if you, whether you're bringing somebody an idea for a, a product, if you're going to an entrepreneur, whatever. It's like why are you the person to do this? Why are you the person to write this script? Why are you the person to do this mini series? Uh, and it doesn't. It's not autobiographical. I have a friend who's doing a, a mini series um, about. Um, a, a, a historical princess that nobody knows anything about and and it's a fascinating story. She's been researching this person for 10 years. So that's something you would say in a pitch. You know, I, I think I think the more commitment they see from you, the more they see that you care, the more they'll care. I mean, because anybody can pitch a story about some vague thing out there. So one of the things I think when he's taught when Peter's talking about degrees, I think you come up with a villain, if you want to call them a villain or an antagonist, use yourself. Use your life. Don't don't try to write from air. I think that that that's bad writing. You gotta use yourself. Who else do you have? That doesn't mean you have to write autobiography. But we're all using ourselves no matter what we do. And I think that's where pitches very often go south is people see you don't have a personal commitment. You don't have the passion. And I didn't want to let the day go without bringing that in because it's really important. No, I think that's a really important point. And it, it might be why you're the person, but you may not have a personal direct connection with the topic. Right. But you can talk about your fascination with it and why you got right. interested in it. Right. So either way, but somehow, one of the interesting points we kept finding over and over again is transmitting your enthusiasm for your project. Right. If you're not committed and they don't see you having passion for it, why should they? And 
this is something that you mentioned. Why did you write this? And yeah. what aspect of it got you so excited? Right. So you could be writing a caveman drama, but if it's something about, you know, I'm really interested in um, interpersonal conflicts and where do they start? When did people go from I need to save my life to I need to dominate you? That's okay, whatever it is, but you need to think about a rationale that was enough to pull you in and get you excited and then your job is to say, how can I transmit this excitement right. to make somebody else curious right. 